afternoon, everyone, and thank, and thank you all for joining us for the Hunt Institute's March Race and Education webinar focused on celebrating women of color and educational leadership. We are thrilled that you all join us. We have a great group of panelists today who will guide you through this conversation. Um, but at the onset, um, it's important for you all to recognize and know a little about the Hunt Institute. Um, the Hunt Institute is committed to having honest and open conversations about issues of race and culture that are embedded and impact all education. The Race and Ed ser webinar series is an opportunity for us to provide access to people and organizations from across the country and across cultures to um, who are committed to improve educational outcomes for marginalized and underserved populations. And for this webinar, we found it so important to bring us together because women make up approximately 76% of the teaching workforce, but yet account for only 24% of superintendents, less than 17% of school principals, and only 3% of K-12 superintendents. And we're not even talking about um, CEO positions in other, in other organizations as well. We're, they're woefully underrepresented, and that's a, that's, a, that's a major disparity that needs to get um, fixed in the, as soon as possible. Um, so why is there such a large disparity? What are the barriers that keep women out of leadership positions? And how can we celebrate and uplift women of color currently serving in leadership roles? So in honor of Women's History Month, we are here today to celebrate these amazing women of color who are doing some phenomenal work throughout their organizations. And they're gonna to speak to you about their journeys, um, how, they, how they shape women, leaders of color, and how they are creating spaces for other women like themselves to enter leadership positions in an industry that is dominated by males at their levels. And so without further ado, I'm gonna introduce Dr. Kathy Dearenwater, who is the Vice President of Programs and Research at the American Indian Science and Engineering Society. Um, she's a citizen of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma, and she joined um, her organization in October of 2014 and completed her doctoral degree in ecology at the University of um, UC Davis in September 20. Uh, no, to, to 2015. Um, as a longtime member of the American Indian Science and Engineering Society, she has bring a first hearing, first hand experience and passion to the mission of increasing representation of Native people in STEM studies and careers. And as part of, the, of that work, she oversees program development, implementation, evaluation, and reporting of all um, ACES special projects, serving their youngest students to senior level professionals. Um, in addition, she serves as a program director on all research projects, such as the National Science Foundation funding Lighting the Pathway to facilitate careers for natives in STEM. Um, so without further ado, I'll turn it over to her, who will guide you through this amazing conversation with our incredible panelists. Yes, thank you so much for that warm introduction. I'm happy to be here today. Um, I just wanted to briefly say that ASIS sorry, <laughs> our doorbell, um, but that ACES, um, our mission is to increase the representation of indigenous people in science, technology, engineering, and math education and careers. I'm happy to say that we are an indigenous women-led organization. So super excited to be part of this conversation and to get to welcome and introduce um, an amazing group of um, female leaders. So I would also want to thank you all for being here today. Uh, and I'd like to take time now to ask the panelists to introduce themselves um, and share their journey as women of color in leadership. And I think let's start alphabetical with Kira, if you don't mind. Absolutely. So first of all, it's, it's an honor to be here uh, for such a consequential conversation. I do want to thank the Hunt Institute uh, for holding space for to celebrate women of color in leadership. When I got the invitation, I, I would have moved mountains. I moved anything, but I would have moved more than that because um, it just feels really wonderful. And I'm sure my, my fellow uh, panelists agree. It just feels wonderful to be seen and, and recognized for, um, for, for, for the work that we collectively do. And, um, and it's an honor. So, uh, First things first, um, I am originally from New York City, born and raised in the Bronx. I've spent my whole adult life in Louisiana, uh, but I was born in the Bronx, grew up in the poorest congressional district in this country, grew up, um, you know, you know, in a community where, you know, our dreams, you know, for our own children were probably much larger than our paychecks. And yet we still uh, believe that a quality education would be at least in part a viable um, solution in helping to ensure 
children in our community could accomplish our dreams. And I was raised by a single mom. Um, I'm a proud Afro Latina. And, um, and, you know, my mom made a lot of sacrifices growing up that, you know, as I get older, and I look back on my own journey and on on the choices she made made many sacrifices for me, and for my brother to have have a fighting shot at a good education, recognizing that that would be um, the best, most viable way forward for me to be able to accomplish my own goals and dreams for myself. Um, flash forward many, many, many years. Um, you know, because of the experiences I actually had with incredible teachers who worked hand in hand alongside my mom and, and other members of my own family to help me find a way, I was um, drawn to education and I spent a significant amount of time, uh, you know, both first in the classroom and then in various education roles, seeing the system um, from for, for many angles, trying to improve the lives of young people. And uh, most recently, I was the vice president of our um, state board of education uh, for 12 years, I served proudly three su successful, you know, terms representing New Orleans on the state board. And I also have the great privilege of being the CEO of Teach Plus right now, entering into my second year. It's nice to be here. Maya. Oh, okay. I was unmuting. Anticipation. <laughs> well, welcome everybody. My name is Maya Morales Garcia. I have the pleasure of being the chief program officer at Beyond 100K. Um, when I think about my journey coming to STEM, um, I think about how my uh, my roots really informed how I grew into this this world, um, specifically into STEM leadership. And so often, when I tell my story of belonging, as we often do in Beyond 100K, of belonging and non-belonging in STEM. Um, I talk about my family. I talk about my first teachers as parents and my community. I talk about how my father rooted us in place, even in his garden and in community as a go-to um, to kind of navigate issues that we were facing. So I grew up in Los Angeles um, and shifted to a rural community in South Texas called Falcurias where everyone is your cousin. Um, and that's kind of where my roots formed and my identity and STEM formed. Um, but it was the involvement and engagement of my parents, parents who themselves um, didn't really know how to navigate the education system, started to lean in and then kind of engage with other family members in the community, became translators, became architects, became leaders in their own right, sitting at the table, demanding a space at the table in school budget meetings and things like that, modeling for us how to take an active role in demanding what we needed um, to be, to be uh, receiving equitable education. So I carried that with me. And because I was good at math and good at science, um, I was gonna be a doctor. And so that was the narrative that um, if you are successful and you are smart, then that translates into something that earns a lot of money or has prestige. And for my parents, that was becoming a doctor. And so when I think about, um, you know, and I fast forward here, I had a couple of experiences that signaled to me that I didn't wanna go into STEM. I didn't wanna go into a discrete science and work in a lab, that my place really was in the translation space and the learning science space and, and, and investing and pouring into the youth, right? So thinking about how educators um, and Latinas like myself, um, Chicanas really modeled for me how to really tie in community-based science and I wanted to make that something that I did for students. And so I became a middle school teacher in the District of Columbia, where I also elevated into teacher leadership and then um, pivoted then to lead STEM education at the district uh, for the District of Columbia and then shifted over to leading STEM for the state of Colorado. Um, I accredit that curiosity, that sense of needing to form or demand a seat at the table to my parents and how they modeled that for me. Um, as, as leaders in their own right and stepping into that space and demanding that. Um, I am so thankful to the Hunt Institute for, for engaging us in this conversation. It is really, really essential and I look forward to, to more discussion. Awesome, and I guess I'll close this out. Good morning, after, afternoon to some, morning to others uh, if you are on the West Coast. Uh, my name is Nadia K. Selby. I'm the CEO for Citizen Schools. So excited to be here to kind of engage with both Maya and Kara on this panel today. So Dr. Kathy, Kathy, you're in for a whirlwind of like discussion and conversation. 
Uh, I was born in St. Vincent in the Grenadines and immigrated to America at a very young age, around five. Uh, and my family was like striving for the next, like the American dream, really looking towards better opportunities around education and like how do we engage overall. And I grew up also in New York, Kira. So I am from Jamaica, Queens, uh, New York, um, wholeheartedly grew up and went to school there for a while before moving to Massachusetts, in which I got connected to citizen schools. So I've been with citizen schools now, yep, for about 16 years, which is unheard of um, in the nonprofit sector, in a nonprofit world. But um, part of how I got connected to citizen schools was through their teaching fellowship. Uh, program and really wanting to be engaged with working with young people, although my family wanted me to do nursing. Um, <laughs> I wanted to be in education and I had the opportunity through citizen schools while in school to really start getting my feet wet in working with people and understanding what it means to work within a school environment. What does it mean to work in uh, like districts and more wholeheartedly, like what are all the components to engage families, communities, and schools and educators together uh, throughout my journey. So, and I stayed with Citizen Schools, one, because of some of the opportunities I've had to grow, um, two, because of some of the work in which we have uh, been able to do, which we'll talk about as we navigate. So I'm excited to have this conversation, start this journey together. Awesome. Thank you all. This is such an exciting panel. So I'm ready to dive in if you are. Um, Nadia, it's going to be back to you for our first question. Um, so your work at Citizen Schools is focused on empowering schools, districts, and communities to work together to create and sustain authentic experience-based learning. What have been, um, what has it been like navigating that space and how have you overcome barriers? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, it's been both exciting and challenging to kind of navigate that space. I would say exciting because there's nothing like the power of seeing young people participate and seeing the learning that happens when you actually have them engage with community members, when you actually have them engage with their content that they're learning in a new way um, and applying it to real world problems. So seeing that impact and seeing the smile, seeing families like engage and kind of say like, you know, I didn't know they could actually do that um, is what really excites me about the work. And as you know, with excitement, especially within the education landscape, there are also barriers and systematic challenges uh, that also play a role in trying something new. Even within a post within a post COVID world where you would think there's so much more flexibility in how people approach education, how they want to think about something new. Um, but instead, what we have been able to find is just we just go back to the what we have been doing, um, what we have done, and what we are really priding ourselves for is like how can we find the communities, how can we find the schools that are ready to take that chance? How can we find folks that are ready to say? you know what, I want to go against the grain. I'm not afraid uh, to try something new. But in real re reality, what we have found is that little bit of a hesitation because there are some larger systematic, um, really ingrained uh, challenges or barriers that are there that are hindering us from kind of implementing some of those uh, widespread changes that we would hope to see in learning environments across the country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Kira, did you want to respond at all to that or? I was just snapping. Okay, just good. <laughs> <laughs> if you have more. Um, okay, so our, our next question, shifting gears here just a little bit, and this question is for Kira. Um, given the amazing work Teach Plus does to build capacity for policy and advocacy with teachers, how are you preparing teachers to address issues like glass ceilings and implicit bias? Um, as they pursue careers in leadership? Yes, good, good question. I, you know, I think it does start first with like centering um, and, and getting clear on certainly like one's own experience, right? Um, because the more you're in touch with that, the more authentic a place from which you are able to lead and help shape the experiences of others. Um, and so, you know, I've been reflecting a lot on my 12 years of service as as uh, the representative of New Orleans on the State Board of Education, right? So, you know, 
you know, on paper constitutionally in not, not in dispute, right? This particular function that I had for 12 years was the highest ranking education official in the city of New Orleans, right? As vice president, I'm the second highest, I was, I'm newly retired, but I was the highest ranking, second highest ranking official in, this, in the state, right? Responsible for all policy for 750,000 students, the governance of New Orleans for much of a decade, and, um, and the hiring and evaluation of the state superintendent of education, right? I say this to say, you know, clear authority, clear indisputed authority. And yet I think about, um, you know, earlier in my tenure in that very public um, role and, and how many times I would be working in my own community, right? With, with other elected officials, you know, other educators, most importantly, teachers, um, real community stakeholders who had a vision for their own, you know, children's education. And I'd, you know, we'd be working, no, you know, on any number of challenges. We'd be sitting around a table and they would have ideas and they would say, why don't we try this one? And I would say, absolutely. I, you know, let's try to get this moving, right? I, I have the authority to help. Like, let me use my, my formal position to sort of help us move an agenda forward. And in almost every meeting, someone would look up and say, but wait a second, wait a second, like, don't you need to get the, don't you need to get the approval or the permission of the state superintendent? And, and I would be like, oh, you're right. Let me write that down. Let me get the, and then I'd like stop in the middle of my like writing, like, wait a second. I, he actually reports to me. Like I'm actually his boss. Let's be really clear. Right. And, and so this was really ultimately, I'm tell this story to sort of sh shape kind of the mindset work that I had to do. Right. Um, to, to understand that even though so many of the signals tell me that even though I'm in this role, somebody else is in charge, right? Somebody, I have to ask somebody else for permission, right? Um, I myself um, am actually um, working on getting more comfortable and it was a process of over 12 years and one that I still were getting comfortable with being like in charge, right? when that isn't always affirmed by others, right? Like including the state superintendent who often did think he was in charge, right? Um, and so there, there is something around uh, beginning with the psychology of leading and, and the trauma that goes along with leading as a woman of color that is very important to understand in oneself if we are then going to create the conditions for others to understand and learn that. So to your question about teachers, it starts with how we train our executive directors who are ultimately responsible for the facilitation of, of our teachers development. We have been doing a lot of work at Teach Plus to help our teacher, our leaders, especially our leaders of color, um, executives of color get clearer on their own level of conviction, their own clarity about the work, their own voice, their own executive positioning. All of these elements, um, not because they're like they don't create the conditions that have led to the fact that we even have to take on that work, but certainly we want to make sure they're empowered and able to, to then address it um, and that they then feel confident doing that with their teachers as well. So that our teachers understand the dynamics, particularly our teachers of color who are interested in leadership, who are looking to us. Um, to, as, a, as a way forward, as a model forward for what that looks like. So that's a bit of it, but it, it actually does start with like getting in touch with the own experiences that have happened in my own life that I have to actually now go back and disrupt and better understand and not internalize, but actually recognize I'm now in a position to actually help other leaders, particularly women of color, do that for themselves as well. Can I say one thing, uh, Dr. Kennedy? I think exactly what Kira was just saying. Sometimes we often, as, uh, as for me, even as a Black woman, like really high in terms of performance, really good at being an implementer. And the moment, even through my journey, when I had to shift from being implementer to now strategic thinker, visionary, and like leader of that, sometimes there is that hesitation or that self doubt that kind of plays a role in just like, man, I know if I was doing this, I could execute this to the best of my yeah. ability, but now I have to execute it through others and I have to deliver results through others and seeing how I'm able to like grow to that level. Oftentimes, a lot of it is we're capable. Part of it is just like, are, is everyone going to take me as seriously as I know this is um, coming from me? And sometimes it takes real work um, for me, even as a Black woman, to understand that I am in the right space, I am in the right seat, I earned this seat, 
Yeah. And how do I lean into that power? How do I lean into that space comfortably and confidently overall? Yeah. And, and, you know, the, the reason I told the part of the story about sitting with my own community and even my community deferring to a white male who reported to me, right? It was, it, it was like almost internalized by all of us, not just me that like, wait a second, somebody else other than us has to give us permission to lead in our own community. And I started to realize over the course of the time that I was in that role, that part of my role was disrupting that not only for myself, but for my community too, right? Um, which is really important work. We would say that is the work, right? That is, <laughs> yeah. No, I'm, I'm just nodding my head because all of this really flows, I think, into the prompt that I have, Dr. Kathy, right? And, the, and almost even the work. I'd love to, to pop over if that's okay with you and weave in here. So at, at Beyond 100K, what we're leading is we're, we're thinking about ending the STEM teacher shortage by 2043, right? And what that's gonna take, and in 10 years, really thinking about the recruitment retention of STEM educators, but within that, how, we're not gonna resolve that issue unless we attend to equity, representation, and belonging, right? And what does it take to foster a work environment of belonging for our Black, Latine, and Native educators, right? When, um, and so really leaning in with our community to tease apart some of the, what are the persistent challenges impacting this area? And, um, and thinking about like, if we want students to feel emboldened and see themselves in STEM, see themselves as leaders in the community, how do we create and shape those pathways of belonging? That has to one, start early, earlier than it does for most of our students. Quite frankly, a lot of students that, that I worked with, even in Colorado and DC, didn't get science, real science education until high school. Um, they were in double black math and literacy classes, not receiving that wonderful relevant um, learning experience that Nadia was referring to earlier about like how to empower that. And I think what we have to do is we are we have to interrogate the, the type and quality of learning experience and learning environment that our students are in. And we're trying to do that. Um, and I think Beyond 100K is doing that. I know we're doing that with our over 170 partners. We're trying to nugget at the over 80 persistent challenges that we've started to map um, around these issues. And, and for, for STEM specifically, we see the STEM teacher workforce, when we think about the numbers associated with it and um, the discrepancies around women in STEM, even entering the workforce, we, we see increases writ large in the number of women and women of color entering the workforce. But we see for STEM careers, they're not in those mid-wage, high-wage areas. We're in those, those entry-level positions. So when we actually dig into the numbers, how do we empower youth? Are especially our youth of color to step into spaces where they are um, feeling more comfortable stepping into those mid-level, high-level leadership, often leadership positions in labs, in corporations, in places where they're being asked to design and lead a team um, while still addressing the biases, the stereotype threat, the, all of those different things that are all important to navigate when we get into um, higher ed and, and even through K-12. But like when we attend to this sense of belonging, um, that's that's really uh, what we're leaning into as an organization is how do we navigate if the root is belonging, how do we ensure that happens um, for all students in, the, in America? And, and I believe that is where we start. So our partners like uh, TechBridge Girls, some other organizations are leaning into this in really rich and intensive ways, Million Girls Moonshot, other programs to think about what is specific for young women of color? What does that experience need to look like? Um, so we can do what, what Kira was talking about and invest in their leadership journey early on. So I just want to, to kind of do a little bit of connecting of the dots because I think it's beautiful. We have practitioners and, and lived, and then we're trying to figure out how do we mobilize a, an, an army, if you will, of people to do this work more intentionally. So I'll pause there. Yes, thank you, Maya, for weaving that through and getting us through our next question. Um, so I wanted to remind the audience to submit questions for Q&A because that's coming up. I have one, um, another question for the panel. This is for all of you to respond to. Um, it's a very big question, so I'm sure you'll build off of each other. But uh, what challenges do women of color in the education field face that their male counterparts do not? Yes, <laughs> just a few things, I'm sure. Uh, 
All right, you all jump in here because there's probably a list of, of what we actually face. Um, first, I'll probably just mention one, um, and it's just one that I've also struggled with connecting to what we shared earlier was just the stereotypes that are attached to um, women of color, especially Black women um, overall, where if you have a strong voice, if you have a clear direction and a clear way in which you want to communicate the path forward, or if you disagree, you may be labeled as such like an angry Black woman, or you might be, your expectations are too high, you are very aggressive. Um, are terms which all rub me the wrong way, but there are terms that often play a role that also mentally has an impact on how we leave or how we try to go against those when communicating in spaces. So we often take more time to make sure that people are um, walking along the journey with us. We're careful about certain words that we use that oftentimes our male counterparts don't necessarily need to, even males of color. Sometimes they can enter a space, them being very clear and direct comes off as strong and comes off as like, yes, we can get behind that leader. But the minute a Black woman or a woman of color sometimes just leads in that way, it comes off a little bit different. Um, and it comes off more challenging versus partnership and connectivity. I think that's a great, that's a, that's a great flag. I would add to this, um, if we scan out at the teacher workforce, specifically the STEM teacher workforce, uh, the pathway to becoming a leader is, especially for women of color, takes a lot longer. Um, meaning that most of our, our female educators in the workforce are elementary educators, less likely to be tapped, to pull, be pulled into leadership, cultivated, mentored, um, and, and often those programs and those pathways don't exist. You have to seek out amazing programs like Teach Plus and get involved, right? And, and, and invest in that learning. Or you have the blessing of attending an HBCU and getting your certification. So you have a built-in network. Um, and we see that more and more we see organizations, affinity groups popping up to support the journey of our educators of color. But that early entry point, that, that length of time, often you see women pop and you might be teaching 20 years before someone says, you should work at the district. You might think about leadership. And so the, the pathway, whereas we see men hop readily into direct into leadership, get tapped into these positions. And so we need to be more uh, like more intentional about pulling women into and, and advocating for them at different leadership, in different leadership spaces and different leadership roles and, and taking an active role in that is what I would say. I would completely agree with, with, with these incredible reflections that have been shared. And I would add, um, you know, as I got further along in my own kind of, my own kind of leadership journey and more comfortable sharing experiences when something occurred or several things occurred where I, you know, was having that feeling like I was crazy or you know, not being heard or I'm saying something, but it's not landing. And then someone else in the room says something, the exact same thing I just said, but now all of a sudden it lands. That's a very common experience that I think many, uh, many women in leadership roles experience, you know, and, and as that happened at scale and I had more and more kind of responsibility and authority publicly leading, um, I got better at sharing my stories and sharing it in safe communities with other women of color who were also sharing theirs. And those communities, by the way, have been, are invaluable. And when we start to think about solutioning and what does it take to support women of color and roles like this, so much of what has helped me has been those, those types of communities, whether it be the, you know, being able to be a part of the founding leadership committee of EDLOC um, that has played such a critical role for so many women of color over the years, ex ex except exceptional work that EDLOC has done, or Pahara, the fact that Pahara um, is run by an incredible woman of color, and I want to say almost entirely senior leadership team of color who are doing incredible work. And I just actually came from a CEO uh, woman of color retreat uh, with Edlock. Um, I'm sorry, with Pahara last week, where a lot of these issues came up. And and you know, there's the issue of feeling trusted, right? Um, you know, you're in the role. Clearly, you've you've demonstrated capability to get to the role, and yet there's the feeling that you are still proving yourself in the role, as if you are still 
you know, having to apply for the role while you were living in the role, right? So this issue of trusting women of color, right? Fundamentally seems like a basic idea, but it was something that came across in so many different stories that people told over and over again. And I wanna name something else, which is the, um, for many of us, um, this, this work is personal. We all started with personal connections to this work, right? I understand what it's like for my mother to not have a good school to send me to, right? I understand what it is like to actually expect an education system to work for me and it fail me and my brother repeatedly who still does not have a high school diploma, right? Like I understand what that's like. And so I think when the work is personal, which it is for many of us, right? There is an additional burden that comes with that whether it's the translation that we do between the work in our own communities, or whether it is the internalizing of the stress that compounds over the years. Some of us are going into our third and fourth decades. And some of the things that came up in our, in our you know, sacred space that we had last week with other women of color was just like the health. You know, what does this do over time to our health, our own well-being, our own sustainability? You know, um, women of color already have like, you know different levels of mortality rates, health, I mean, every measure, right? We are already challenged outside of education. All of that plays into our work in education as well. And so the ability to sort of care for and take care of ourselves and kind of put our own mask first so that we have that much more to give our own communities and give our own you know, organizations and systems is a real challenge. Um, and, and something that I think, you know, only through community and through the sharing of practices and ideals and, and values do we have a path forward, but that's what I'd add. I would say one last piece um, that we didn't necessarily tap into is that familial, like, responsibility, responsibility as, like, parents and uh, things as you navigate and as you move through. Granted, men are also parents uh, at moments and at times, but oftentimes the ways in which meetings or like uh, conferences, like gatherings or all of those pieces, they're catered in such a way that they're not equitable for catering or considering like other parts of the role or parts of a human as they think about um, engaging in work. So for me, even as like navigating, like, hey, can you do this? Can you do this? Um, and it's often asked of me and a male of color even, or a, of a male in general. And a lot of it is like, yeah, but I'm a single mom. I also have to do all of these things. I have to make sure I'm like checking these three things for my sitter. And then oftentimes I'll get passed over because someone who is not that engaged or has other support uh, is able to just take that spot and like kind of fill in in that moment. So the access might not be there just because of the ways in which my um, my family is structured or just in the ways in which I have been um, brought up that kind of gives other access to folks who are not. It, can I, I have to say one thing because you just opened up a whole new thing. Now. Like, I know, I know. <laughs> and, then, and then that's it. And then I promise we're going to stop. But this is the thing. This is what I mean by being in dialogue in community. Mm -hmm. This is the path. Like yeah. this is a big part of, of, of solutioning. But here's what I'll, I'll say to build so perfectly. And what Nada, you shared was my my dear friend, Tulane Montgomery, who, who leads another um, extraordinary woman of color leading another organization um, as their CEO once said to me early on, you know, my first six months in this role, you know, it's to the point of access, you know, as in general, there is an expectation that you will caretake. Yes. That you will caretake, mm -hmm. that there, that your time is boundless, that you, that they, that there is an unfettered access to you, yeah. to, almost to your physical body. And she's breaking this down to me. We're going all the way back to slavery, right? Like we're talking about the origins of access to yeah. women of color's bodies and, and how that translates to the professional context in the sense that you, you are, there's an access that people expect of your time, of your attention. Um, and then if it is not granted as it should be, there is the possibility of, you know, there's an entitlement to it and then a resentment if it doesn't occur. And so there is a pattern that needs to break around how you spend your time, how you protect your time, how you set boundaries, et cetera, that actually like plays out in many organizational ethos based on the sort of long history of, of what people feel they have access to with women of color. So I know I'm going all the way there, but like- No, we have to go there. That's what this is about. 
Yeah. <laughs> she has said that. She has yeah. said that to me. We're, we're going to talk about healthcare now <laughs> and mental health and wellness because it's all interconnected. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Mm. Thank you so much for sharing all that. Oh, and so much of it resonates and absolutely. So, okay, I have some questions in the Q and A. Um, our first question is, uh, women are often gathering or networking to share their experiences, but we walk away and back into patriarchal and racist environments. How do we gather or network differently? Hmm. I, I, I spoke a bit to. I know, that's how I was like, I was like you want to go first and then we'll fill in. Yeah, I look, I, I'm telling you, this uh, the work that Pahara is doing, particularly in the mm -hmm. space of holding yeah. sacred space for women of color is invaluable. And yeah. what, I, what was beautiful about the time we were together was, um, it, 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 you know, there's a time and a space for like consultancies. We all need to understand mm -hmm. how we structure our, our leadership teams, but, but like what we really needed was to be in community. We danced together mm -hmm. and we read poetry together and we understood what was tr most true for each other at, at the soul level. And that from that place in the building of community and trust in that way, I now left with like 20 other mm -hmm contacts, relationships, people in my network, I can now call upon mm -hmm. to carry the work forward um, in, in a collaborative way. And, and, I, and I just think in part, maybe there's a suite of solutions we need, but in part, I do genuinely believe there's something powerful about the collective sharing of, of experiences. And, and a big part of that experience was about the sharing of our stories. Mm -hmm right? Not just the burden parts, but the joyful parts, like, because a lot of joy exists in this work. That's why we're still here. Yes. Um, but there's something in the collective community and the wisdom that I am convinced is a very important part of the solution. Yeah. I would just double on down on that. I mean, obviously I work for an organization that supports a network. So we truly believe in what you're saying, but I think the power and what's important is, is me as a leader, as a woman, of color holding that sacred space to be in community with others is something that um, is can be difficult to find. Those that's the only way I got through college. That's the only reason that I got a STEM degree is because I had La Unidad, which was a coalition of Latina women in STEM that were like we had a I had a big sister. I had all of these different that connected and understood where I was coming from. Understood that the I needed sun to thrive in Massachusetts, right? Like all of these things that play into our ability to, to thrive in leadership or to move past some of those, uh, work through the trauma even that we were facing and then celebrate together. That takes uh, that sacred space. And so I think um, exactly what you said, we need more of that um, in addition to other things like pay equity. Um, but I'll hand it over to Nadia. Drop that in there. <laughs> pay equity is, uh, is there as well. One thing that I would say, um, and I see this question come from Kendra, there's there's a there's one thing for, for people of color, women of color, black women to get together and talk. There's another thing to move from that conversation and stay connected. Yeah. Because sometimes we go right back into just doing the work and lose all of the connections because we're so ingrained and passionate about what we are doing and what we're engaging in. But what we do lose in being so narrow-minded at moments when we get back out of those opportunities is we lose. It's like we're waiting until we go back into doing the same cycle, doing the same exact thing. And we're actually not bettering ourselves. We're not getting out of the, we're not understanding different ways to um, navigate challenges. So I could you not, I have a set of CEOs across who are women of color, who are leading organizations, that I will call and be like, hey, I'm dealing with this. Like, this is a situation. I have a board meeting tomorrow. Here is my rundown because I am using that network, but I had to learn to actually lean on it. So I'm in spaces. I'm a part of Edlock as well. And like within spaces, we're sharing ideas. We're doing thought leadership in the live moment while we're together. But oftentimes we don't pick back up the phone after that. We don't offer that dual, I can help and you can help 
opportunity <laughs> to kind of go back and forth with each other in order for us both to grow. So to think yeah. that both Kira and I, who have never met That's right. each other, no two lane as like a major CEO of another, it's because we're all Black women leading organizations. So there's not so many of us. So we yeah. kind of, when we meet, we want to stay connected or want to stay engaged, but it's up to us to also not let the work squish us. Um, other, because we do get, and that burns us out. We get burnt out and we don't use our networks to help us like dismantle some of that. I agree. Yes. Can't let the work get us down. <laughs> <laughs> always it's, it's like it's not just down it's like the like I what I hear and what you're saying is the intentional cultivation of community of investing is like is work is the work we is a part of the work mine you said that is part of the work and yet it, you know it's like you almost have to shift your mindset because you could think that that's like luxurious when you get back to it right so here I was for three days at, at Lone Rock you know, in the middle of the woods with all of these beautiful women of color singing, dancing and, you know, plant plotting the future. And, and then I'm coming back into like mounds and mounds of legit work. And I'm feeling crazy guilty and stressed. Like I'm guilty that I took those days off, right. That I'm stressed that like, oh my gosh, I've got to dig out of my inbox. I I'm late on this deadline. And so it's very easy to actually then turn that part of yourself off and get back to it. But what I, the call that I hear so clearly, you know, Nadia, and what you're saying is like that, that's part of the perpetuation of, of like the challenge that we have to disrupt. And I think that's real, you know, it's hard. Absolutely. I was gonna say, where's the time to do that? <laughs> it can be, you have to be intentional about it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so another question, um, and I love, I love questions like this because we often talk about barriers. Um, so the question is, what does thriving in leadership mean to you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm going to give you a funny answer. Um, Thriving in leadership means to me that I can really be engaged, tapped into work, really getting, um, uh, really going out, doing what I have to do for my actual position. But I also have a space in which I'm getting eight hours of sleep at night. Yeah. What's funny about that? That's like real. <laughs> that, that's it. Like, that's when I know, like, I am really thriving in my work. Things are getting done, but I have that balance of career and life. Like I do, I'm able to breathe when really doing hard, dynamic work out into the field. I feel like that should be the normal. But that's, that's a good answer. I was thinking about finding flow. Like, you know, how we, we think about the infinity sign and, and, and work is going to be work no matter what, but like thinking about the space where I feel healthy in my body. So much of what Kira mentioned and Nadia mentioned about sleep are about our wellness and like being able to show up as our full authentic selves in these spaces where we're not getting questioned about how we're, sh how we're, how we're making policy shifts or changes. Like the, for me, thriving is no one's questioning my presence in that room um, as well. And, and, or I don't care if they are, I already don't, but, um, just thinking about that presence in a space and feeling that sense of belonging, um, as well as, uh, finding that flow between personal wellness and well-being and being able to show up as my full self as a leader. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would just round this out and say, I agree. I, both of those things deeply resonate with me. I'd add like, you know, I, I don't shy away from making, doing hard things. In fact, I believe, I feel best when I am in community doing hard things together with others that drive a path forward for young people. 
And I think that like at my best or when I would feel most alive or fulfilled, I'd be able to do that without like fear, without the fear of uh, getting it wrong or the fear of not looking good or the fear, you know, all of the like more cosmetic components that come from, uh, you know, that sort of exist, that exist, that sort of get in the way of like the most authentic level of the work. And so when I'm most alive, most in flow, I think I'm, I'm able to like quell that and, and hone in on like, what is truly best for children? What is best for my community or school? Whatever it is I'm trying to solve. And like, that becomes the focal point, right? And not all the other noise or narratives you've got in your head that come very much from like the societal sort of like tape that's on that, that I think get, get in the way of that. And at the heart of it is really like quelling fear. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so there's a question in the chat around resources like books, podcasts for women of color navigating leadership um, that may not have access to a similar community. So I think talking about the community you have access to um, that you've shared, but are there other resources um, when that is not as available? So if, if we want to respond to that, if you could give a quick response, but I also think we could use the chat or the answer function in the Q&A too, because I'm sure people will want to have it written down to reference. Um, do we want to respond or do you want to put just answers to that? Okay, because there's another um, a good question here and we're doing we're doing pretty good on time. So I think we could answer this last question we have here. Um, and it is courage and fearlessness have always been important for women of color to make good trouble and good change. Can you talk a bit about courage and fearlessness and their roles in your growth and leadership over time? So courage and fearlessness. Here's what I here's what I'll say on that topic. Mm -hmm. um, you know, on a different day when there's a lot more time, I'll tell y'all a, a longer, very entertaining story um, that that occurred to me in my last year in elected official. For today, I'll tell you the abbreviated version. Essentially, in my last year on the state, on my last sort of term, state board of education, I was tapped to be the chair of the state superintendent search for Louisiana, and um, and I just come off the heels of a very, you know complicated election where I where I was successful, but I've made promises to my community that we were going to be transparent, that we were going to actually be equitable, that we were going to be like, I was going to get their input and I was going to be true to that commitment. So first thing I did as chair was try to design a process that was equitable, transparent to find the next superintendent of education. And for a whole host of reasons, a very small but powerful group of people wanted a very particular person to get the job. And they did all kinds of things that were, um, you know, unfortunate to try to get that to happen while I was trying to hold down and like keep this search going fairly and transparently. And in the end, um, we did run as, as best as we could with all the kinds of stuff we were facing and the nonsense and shenanigans, we did do that. Um, and it required a level of courage. I had to stand alone despite like even people who I'd been close with for years or had considered sort of like partners for years kind of really feeling and putting pressure on me to do something different. And the thing that I learned, and it was terrible. I mean, it was, it was traumatic. It was one of the most traumatic leadership experiences. I've never felt more alone. I felt like, I, I really felt like I would not make it really truly. That's how hard this was. But in the end I did and what I learned in that experience that was so transformative is that when you step out on faith with courage, it is often met with, with people who will meet you with courage. So what happened was all the people who sort of, I was so afraid of upsetting, who I did upset, who basically canceled me, like they shed away and in its place were this new group of like coalition, many people of color and others who saw me act in a way that was courageous and said, I, I want to, I'm going to step out on faith with you. And out of that, a new coalition was born. 
one that was actually aligned and focused on shared values. And like, that was the most surprising thing to me that I didn't expect. I thought I'd be alone. I was ready to be alone because I was doing something courageous and I was gonna live by my values and be true to my community no matter what. But the fact that like that was met by others who said like, I see you and I'm stepping out on day two, courage will be met with courage. And that's what I learned. And then the other key part about that was that when you know your values and you attune to them and you, and that, that, that part about integrity, if you're doing your work with integrity and in connection with your values, then that happens. I think my, my addition would be, um, and, and this is something I carried with me, uh, from my parents is, is that if there's not a seat at the table, then you need to make one for yourself. And so I walked into rooms where I was not, uh, supposed to be and, and, planted myself in situations where uh, a first year teacher should not have been, right? Or in quotes, I walked into a congressional hearing where I was the only woman in the room, much less woman of color and talked about STEM education and brought it up in a room full of business leaders. So I think the other thing is like when you're doing what what inherently you believe and and um, in your soul to be what's right for children and what's right uh, and aligned with your values, then that courage becomes a little bit easier to bear. and then. Um, having people to do it with and building that community is the other essential piece. And fast forward, so taking both of those points and then now you're in the space, now you're in the leadership opportunities and then you look back and you're like, if I don't, then who's opening the door for others to come behind me? So oftentimes as I've navigated a couple of positions within the organization and it's like, what impact would it be if I don't step out and say something? How is what is happening harming uh, individuals across the organization? What is the larger um, challenge that is at stake? And then I have to go back to my why. Like, why is this even important for me to do? Why, why am I really passionate and excited about doing this level of work? And if I don't do this, it hinders our opportunity to drive impact. It hinders our opportunity to do what we're ultimately trying to do. So I lean on that, but it first goes back to, as Kara and Maya were saying, it goes back to knowing yourself, understanding what you're willing to bend, what you're willing not to bend on, and then standing firm on it. What they say, 10 toes down, like I'm in it uh, right now, but it takes you a while to get there. But the goal is when you're there, you got to look back and make sure you're opening the doors for others to also share their thoughts and you're not closing it to other um, mindsets. So people, regardless of if you take the implementation or not, people should always feel comfortable and confident enough within your organization, within your space to share their thoughts in yeah. a way that doesn't get ridiculed. Yeah, that's right. Yes, great insights from brilliant women, as the comments are saying. I completely agree. So we will wrap up with um, a final, not necessarily question, but a call to action, if you will, from our panelists to offer one policy recommendation to increase access and pathways for women in education leadership. Just one? Um, sorry, <laughs> I would name, um, I really just want to highlight, I think we need to, on a larger scale, adapt, I, I hate to kind of use this term a lot because it's so cliche right now, but adapt DEIB policies mm -hmm. to promote change um, and culture in all levels within the school space. So there is a, an opportunity of like access, belief, belonging that plays a role, but when we can't make change if there's larger policies not adopted, to the ways in which we do work. So I would love if the schools and districts and partners that I tap into are really fundamentally trying to learn mm -hmm. ways in which to create systems and approaches to bring uh, women of color into leadership positions, but it takes really recognizing you may have a challenge um, overall by doing some really hard work. Yeah, I agree. I agree. It's been, it's, I think I wouldn't add, I would say, you know, a lot of our work at Teach Plus is about um, developing a policy that helps to diversify the teaching profession, right? Um, and 
like the same and there's policy level work at every level to sort of keep that pipeline all the way up to the most senior roles that are necessary and i just think policies that continue to sort of open um the the door for more representation for more voice for more leaders of color women of color to have have voices um is is invaluable to have significant roles is just invaluable and so i'd advocate for those policies and i know teach plus does I I would just double down on that. I, I think specifically, like when we when we do what the the wisdom of Nadia shared, um, it, we can attend to pay equity in a real way. But I think we also need to push beyond the education sector and think about policies that impact mental health and wellness uh, for women of color as well. And so I, I would be remiss if I didn't bring up the attack on women. In, in health policy and and um, how so much of that stress we hold or those barriers we elevated have to do with our well-being. And so I would add on to the DEI culture um, uh, inherent um, attendance to our public health policy and, and our health system as well. Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you so much. It was a pleasure to be part of this panel. I'm going to turn it over to Jarvis for closing remarks. Thank you all so much. I'm immensely grateful just for all your incredible wisdom um, that you shared today. Um, and just so humbled just to be in the space with you all virtually. Um, so thank you so much. Um, so our participants, thank you all so much as well. And certainly um, join me in thanking our panelists who are just incredible. Incredible, incredible, incredible. Um, if you enjoyed this panel, I want to invite you to a series of other uh, webinars we'll be having as a, at the Hunt Institute in April. I think we have four um, coming. We have some focused on early childhood, others focused on K-12, higher education. And then our next race in education um, webinar will be on April the 16th, focused specifically on um, a book by Dr. Nancy Gutierrez called Stay and Prevail, um, focusing on the, the need not to leave your community to be successful, uh, focusing on our stu student voice there. Um, so stay tuned. We will be sending out key takeaways as well as a recording of this incredible panel um, here today in the coming weeks. So stay tuned for that email as well. Um, again, thank you all so much. Panelists, again, thank you so much. I'll certainly be reaching out to each and every one of you. Could personally, thank you all. Thank you so much. Have a great afternoon. Bye, all. Thank you. Have a good one. Bye -bye. Thank you.